गुड मॉर्निंग एवरी वन माई नेम इज डॉक्टर नीलम सिंह असिस्टेंट प्रोफेसर उत्तर प्रदेश राजर्षि टंडन ओपन यूनिवर्सिटी टूडे आई एम गोइंग टू टेक अ लेक्चर ऑन कोर्स कोड यू जी ई एन वन जीरो वन वोस टाइटल इज रीडिंग पोइट्री एंड अंडर दिस टाइटल आई एम गोइंग टू टेक यूनिट फोर मैथ्यू अर्नॉल्ड डोव बीच बिफोर गोइंग टू स्टार्ट द पोएम वीच शुड डिस्कस अबाउट द पोएट मैथ्यू अर्नॉल्ड वॉज एन इंग्लिश पोएट लिटरेरी एंड सोशल क्रिटिक ऑफ इंग्लैंड ही वॉज बॉर्न ऑन द ईयर ट्वेंटी फोर डिसम्बर एटीन ट्वेंटी टू एट लाल हम इंग्लैंड एंड डाइड ऑन द ईयर एटीन एटी एट लिवरपूल ही वॉज द सन ऑफ द एजुकेटेड डॉक्टर थॉमस अर्नॉल्ड एंड मैरी अर्नॉल्ड He was educated in rugby school where his father was headmaster and he attended Oxford as a scholar of Balliol College. If I talk about his wife, he was married to Frances Lucy Whitman in the year 1851. Now come to the literary career of Matthew Arnold. Matthew Arnold's first volume of poetry was The Stray Traveler and other poems which came in the year 1849. His next collection of poetry was Empedocles on Etna and other poems which came in the year 1852. His next collection was Poems and it is considered as the best collection of Matthew Arnold. His most celebrated work Sohrab Rustam the scholar gypsy are the part of this collection. Apart from this his new poems which came in the year 1869 contains poems like Tiresias Rugby Chapel and Dover Beach which we are going to discuss today Apart from the poetry collections his central work of criticism was Culture and Anarchy which is the masterpiece and which ridicules as well as analysis of Victorian society Let us come to the major characteristics of Victorian age first of all what is the time period of Victorian age The time period of Victorian age is 1837 to 1901. This period was the age of Queen Victoria and this age was in many ways the glorious age of English literature because of the progress it had witnessed. It was the age of tremendous cultural upheaval. The other major characteristics of Victorian age are realism, pessimism, questioning to god modernism conflict between religion and science humanism imagery and symbolism and representation of aesthetic values apart from there are many other uh, characteristics of victorian age but we have only focused on some major one now come to the poem dover beach before going to the poem I am going to give a brief introduction of the poem Dover Beach. This poem was published in the volume entitled New Poems. Matthew Arnold wrote this poem shortly after visiting with his wife Frances Lucy Whitman to the Dover region of South East England and this poem is dramatic monologue. Now what is dramatic monologue? dramatic in a dramatic monologue is a literary device through which a speaker speaks his inner thoughts and there is a silent listener also now in this poem the poet is lamenting on the loss of christian faith in england during the mid 1800s as science captured the minds of the public the speaker of the poem is the poet himself The poem Dover Beach shows the poet's concerns for the diminishing faith and values of Christianity and losing ground to the sciences particularly those related to evolution the origin of species by Charles Darwin which was published in the year 1859 this book was regarded as the masterpiece and it changed the entire thoughts of the Victorian age people in this poem arnold mourns a society that has lots of lost its cultural moral and spiritual significance the rise of cruelty hopelessness uncertainty and deception therefore the mood of this poem dover beach is 
elegiac. Now, come to the title of the poem. The title that is Dover Beach. Arnold wrote this poem shortly after visiting with his wife Frances Lucy Whitman to the Dover region of South East England. The title is the shore of the English ferry port of Dover in Kent facing Calais in France, the Strait of Dover, the narrowest part of the English Channel where Arnold spent his honeymoon in the year 1851. Now come to the theme of the poem. The major theme of the poem is the religious shift. As I said, Charles Darwin's Origin of Species played a very crucial role in this age. So the religious shift was the major theme of this poem. Dover Beach acts as a transitional figure in the whole composition as the tide sets low and the border of the land is left naked. Humankind is losing interest in the Bible. The comparisons between the movement of the sea and the belief of people changing come in a cycle. Faith is lost by the end of the poem, which was touched once by it. Therefore, from the first para to the last stanza, there are different references of change and loss of faith due to ignorance. The next theme is significance of nature. The poet has used natural imagery of beach and the sea. According to the poet, nat nature is beautiful since eternity and will remain like that. But it feels the sadness and happiness of humankind as the development is taking place. Now nature has been thought provoking factor for the poet. And in the end, and the poet talks about the natural surrounding and the present time that people have lost faith and trust, which has had its effect on nature. The next theme is the love, which we can see in the last stanza of the poem. The love, which is present in the last stanza of the poem, shows a kind of hope. The poet hopes that the faith in the religion will be restored by the love people have. He talks to his companion, his wife, and explains that the loss of trust between people can be saved only by love. And through love, all people can find faith. Now, come to the poem. Dover Beach, the first stanza. The sea is calm tonight, the tide is full, the moon lies fair upon the straits. On the French coast, the light cleans and is gone. The cliffs of England stand glimmering and vast out in the tranquil bay. Come to the window, sweet is the night air. So this is the first stanza. Now, the poet is saying that the sea is calm tonight. I have given two pictures of, uh, to explain what is the image uh, Matthew Arnold has presented in this stanza. In the very first picture, you can see the Strait of Dover. This is the part of England and this is the part of France. And this region, and this region is the Strait of Dover, which is the title of the poem, right? Now, the sea is calm tonight. The very first line of the poem presents the setting. This is the night time and the sea is very calm. The tide is full. The moon lies fair. The tide is also uh, full. The, uh, the moon lies fair upon the straits. Now, this is the strait which I already told you. On the French coast, the light gleams and is gone. Now, there is another picture where you can see the sea, the image of sea, the calm sea. And here you can see this part is France, right? And here the poet is standing and watching the sea. 
okay so the poet is saying that the light gleams and is gone where towards the france the cliffs of england stand now poet is looking around himself the cliffs were stand and they were also glimmering and they were vast out in the tranquil bay what is tranquil bay tranquil bay is the peaceful english channel this is the english channel and the poet describes about this english channel that that is tranquil peaceful right now come to the next line now the poet is asking to someone and it is considered as he is calling to his wife come to the window sweet is the night air the poet is requesting to his wife to come to the window because the night is very beautiful the air is uh, very sweet right so this is the explanation the poet begins with the pictorial description of the beach at dover that as i said the time is night the poet is standing on the coast of the sea and observes everything the sea is very calm tonight the tide is up on the sea water and the moon is full upon the straits the poet sees the light that is that gleams on the french coast and suddenly is gone the fluctuating light denotes the fluctuating faith in humanity in religion and here in the metaphorical sense not only the light is gone but it took away the certainty with itself right now the poet shifts his attention to the vast cliffs of england that are stand tall and glimmering out in the peaceful bay the first two lines of the poem presents a scenic view while the later part of the uh, stanza creates a balance and harmony in nature but later it turns into a pathos because now the light is gone and darkness came right now the poet asks his wife who is with him in the room it is not uh, sure whether he is with his wife or with his beloved but as we consider as he is with his wife and he asks to his wife to come to the window to see the beautiful scene of the sea only from the long line of spray where the sea meets the moon blanched land listen you hear the greeting roar of pebbles which the waves draw back and fling at their return of the high strand begin and cease and then again begin with tremulous cadence slow and bring the eternal note of sadness in see i have given a picture there is a sea which is looking very calm there is a moon and the moonlight is we can see on the surface of the water so this is the image a very peaceful and calm scene which the poet is presenting in the first stanza now the poet is saying that only from the long line of spray where the sea meets the moon blanched land see here the moon is meeting to this land the sea and here this this white area is the light right this so this moon blanched land the poet is talking about this portion right now the poet is uh, again saying to his wife listen listen what listen you hear the grating roar of pebbles which the waves draw back now the sea waves are uh, making a noise and what from where this noise is coming this noise is coming from the pebbles which the waves draw back and this pebble were thrown back by the sea tide right at their return up the high strand begin and cease and then again begin look at the beautiful line with tremulous cadence slow and bring the eternal note of sadness in here the meaning of tremulous cadence is trembling in a slow rhythmic movement so the pebbles were making a kind of rhythm a movement right the the sea tide is coming and again going back and the pebbles which were coming with the tide of the sea were again going back and during this uh, time the pebbles were making a sound 
this is making a kind of rhythmic movement right so here the poet is talking about the trembling in a slow rhythmic movement that movement which is originated from those pebbles right now come to the explanation this is the explanation i have already explained you but again we can uh, see this explanation the poet asks his wife who is with him in the room to come up to the window and feel the sweet night air coming from the foamy sea waves dashing against the shore where the sea meets the moon on the white land the surface of the sea looks white why because of the moonlight the poet again asks his wife to listen to the pebbles sound drawn by the sea waves right the waves sling the stones back to the sea and then again throws them back onto the high shore on their return journey this process begins and ceases begins and ceases and then again begins and ceases with slow but fearful rhythm right this sound is producing a sad tone in the mind of the poet it also brings an eternal note of sadness within and this repeated sound evokes melancholy in the poet's mind as i said and it also symbolizes the disordered misery in human life right the receding waves represent the diminishing faith in the world so this is the explanation of the first stanza now come to the stanza 2 stanza 2 begins with sophocles long ago heard it on the aegean and it brought into his mind the turbid ebb and flow of human misery we find also in the sound a thought hearing it by this distant northern sea now in this stanza the poet recalls greek playwright sophocles he was the greek tragic poet and playwright famous for his plays so here the poet has given an illusion from the past he is talking about sophocles who long ago in the past heard it on the aegean what is aegean aegean is the sea lying between greece and asia minor remember what we have seen in the first stanza in the first stanza we have seen that the poet is standing on the dover beach and he is in between england and france right so here the poet is comparing his situation with sophocles he is in present and he is talking about he has talked about in the first stanza about the present situation now he is talking about the past that is uh, with the help of sophocles and who was sophocles he was that greek tragic poet and playwright famous for his plays and here the he is talking about the agency and in the same manner as the poet is hearing the sound of the pebbles which uh, brings a sadistic tone sadistic mood in his mind in the same way the poet says that sophocles has already heard this uh, sadistic tone while standing on the aegean and it brought into his mind the turbid ebb and flow and what is turbid ebb and flow this is the mo movement of water which we have already seen in the first stanza right now of human misery and this movement of water presents a human misery in the past don't forget here the poet is talking about the past we find also in the sound a thought now in these three lines the poet is talking about the past remember in the first three lines the poet is talking about the past and now with the word we the poet again is talking about present right here we is readers we readers find also in the sound a thought hearing it by this distant northern sea and that northern sea is the english channel as we have seen in that picture right so in this stanza the poet recalls the greek playwright sophocles's idea of the turbid ebb and flow of human misery here it is figuratively used to show human misery he says that sophocles long ago heard the sound as he stood upon the aegean shore the sound of the sea brought into his mind as the turbulence and flow of human misery here the sound of sea waves have been described as the eternal note of sadness the poet reconnects his thoughts from the past to the present and says that 
we find his observation similar to sophocles's idea after hearing the sound of the waves of in the english channel which is far away from the agency right here the similarity in loss of faith can be seen between the classical greek age and the 19th century as sophocles has seen human misery at at his time arnold has seen it as a loss of faith of christianity in present so this is the whole explanation of the second stanza now come to the third stanza the sea of faith was once too at the full and round earth's shore lay like the folds of a bright girdle furled but now i only hear its melancholy long withdrawing roar retreating to the breath of the night wind down the vast edges frail and naked shingles of the world so here in this stanza the poet is saying that the sea of faith was once too at the full here the sea of faith is the extended metaphor of humanity of religion thoughts so here the poet is saying that the sea of faith was once too at the full and round the shore it means it was spread everywhere right lay like the folds of a bright girdle fold what is girdle fold girdle fold is the sea of faith as a belt had once covered the entire humanity so once the faith of christianity the uh, the faith of religion was uh, was had covered the entire humanity but now we have lost it right but now now the poet says that but now i only hear its melancholy now what we have only melancholy with drawing roar retreating we are going back blowing of the night wind down the vast edges drear and naked shingles of the world what is shingles shingles is a pile of pebbles well shaped by constant rolling now come to the explanation of this stanza in this stanza the sea turns into sea of faith right this is the metaphor the poet has used here the poet says that there was a time when everyone believed in religion with full devotion religion united the whole human kind on this earth the spiritual and religious faith which was once unbreakable is in its lowest now right the time here was probably the middle ages when religion was everything but darwin's theory of origin of a species in the victorian era brought scientific knowledge and it shook the entire humanity the industrial revolution imperialism etc were the other reasons which attacked on religion the sea of faith that was once enveloped just like a bright girdle fastened around an individual's waist has now receded therefore the poet hears only the melancholy as the long retreating sea waves because the faith on religion has declined it happened because science challenged the question the spirit and it questioned the spiritual ideas and religious religious beliefs therefore love faith is retreating with the night wind here night wind is the symbol of desolation and fear right and perhaps the poet says that the faith in religious beliefs is taking its last breath from the vast miserable world and due to lack of faith the world is naked and exposed to the innumerable tribulations of the world right now come to the fourth stanza now this in this stanza we will see there is a kind of hope as in the first stanza in the second stanza and in the third stanza we have seen a kind of loss of faith a melancholic thoughts but in this stanza the tone has shifted from melancholy to melancholy to positivity so come to the stanza four ah love let us be true to one another for the world 
which seems to lie before us like a land of dreams, so various, so beautiful, so new, has really neither joy, nor love, nor light, nor certitude, nor peace, nor help for pain. And we are here, as on a darkling plain, swept with confused alarms of struggle and flight, where ignorant armies clashed by night. So here, in this stanza, the poet is talking to his beloved, and he says that, in this stanza, belief has been shown that leads to the melancholy which pervades almost all his poem. Arnold gives a ray of hope in this stanza. In this stanza, the poet is a kind of optimistic that there, yes, there is still a hope that is left. We have something, right? So the poet tells his beloved to be committed in their love to each other. Love appears to be the only comfort in this world and with love, life seems beautiful like a land of dreams. But it has no joy, no hope, and certainty or peace in reality. Neither is there any relief from the pain of life. People living in the world are like the ignorant armies on a dark plain, and they fight with each other, and they don't know that we all are human beings, and why are we fighting with each other? We all are human beings. So we are kind of ignorant armies. So the poet says that, Human beings are like ignorant armies and they are fighting with each other. So they are confused. Instead of this, they should follow religion, science, because science and religion are two opposite poles. On the one hand, you can follow science. On the other, you can follow religion. Right? Darkling pain suggests the world where so much restlessness, suffering and pain are there. It also shows pessimism and glory picture of humanity. So, this is the whole explanation of the poem. Now, we will discuss the uh, structure, form and literary devices of the poem. Right? So, the poem is written in four stanza and having variable uh, number of lines. Some lines are small and, and some lines are long. There is no consistent rhyme scheme, but few words rhymes with each other like uh, tonight, night, fair, air, stand, land, strand, bay, spray. And uh, the poem is written in free verse. The tone of the stanza shifts from first stanza to last stanza, that is from melancholy to the cheerful in the end. Literary devices. The first literary devices that the Arnold has used is alliteration. These are the examples of it. Gleams and is gone, long line, then again begin, melancholy long, etc. Metaphor. The poet has used sea of faith as an extended metaphor. Land of dreams is the, another metaphor that the poet has used. The repetition of is in the first four lines illustrates the nightly seaside scenery. Next is auditory image. Listen, you hear the grating roar shows the sad, desperate and hopeless picture of the world. Now come to the visual image. The first stanza gives a beautiful visual image of sea. There is an illusion also that the poet has given an illusion of Sophocles. Then the enjambment, uh, lines 15 and 20. And, is just one long sentence broken up over six lines and this makes the connection between the distant past and the present seem almost seamless. Now there is simile also, lay like the folds of a bright girdle fold, right? The grating roar in the first stanza becomes the withdrawing roar in the third stanza and it suggests the harsh sound that brought sadness with itself is now withdrawing itself. Why? Because nothing is left in the name of faith and only isolation, loneliness and melancholy is left, right? Now the tone of the last stanza is hopeful, at the same time it turns into pessimism. Confused life of a man has been compared with the confused fight of ignorant armies on a darkling plain in the last stanza. 
and the poet has also used an archaic word hat in this poem so i hope you understand the poem we have uh, discussed the whole poem in a very detailed way we have also discussed the structure of the poem the various figures of speech the literary devices in the poem so this is all for today thank you mm -hmm.